Uh, well, anyways, again, uh, we're going to be picking right back on up in Romans 4. And, and really, I, I don't know about you guys, but I have been loving this series uh, you know, with you know, trying to figure out how can we really bring the book of Romans to life every Friday at the great time of 6 a.m. Ray Kramer has been helping us. Uh, the ministers just really uh, connect with this book. Because really this book is about uh, edifying a church, but really edifying disciples and teaching them how to be real, authentic Christians, especially at a time that it was really, really hard. Um, and so this is a great book, I think, for our church, especially with the times that we're going through. But it's just a great book for just anybody that is really looking to connect with God in a special way. And so Romans 4 is our time here. And I wanted to start off with the story. And maybe you guys have heard this before, but as I was writing this sermon, I was looking at different articles, and I ran into this one. And it was a pretty crazy story, so it starts off like this. In December of 2019, a Texas woman by the name of Ruth Balloon, I love that last name, Balloon, went to check her bank balance on her phone after a shift from her job. And so, be honest raise your hand, who dreads when they check their bank account on their phone? Yes, right? You know, like, I don't know about you guys, but I can be one of those people that can go a long time, maybe swiping my card and not checking my bank balance on my phone, and that's probably really bad financial practices. Um, and I know uh, Abraham is looking at me saying, bro, you need to you need a, you need a look at that app every time. Uh, But when she went to check her phone, she saw that her bank account was stacked with an extra $37 million. And look at this. This is her. That's Ruth. But look at her app. It literally says $37 million on her bank app. So knowing it was too good to be true, her and her husband called their bank, obviously, and the bank was like, I'm so sorry, that was such a big mistake, please, 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 like, forgive us. Um, and then ABC7 Chicago went to go ask her what she was going to do with this money. And as Christians, we, we can, we're probably going to be impacted by this, but literally she said this, I was going to do 10% tithing, then I was going to donate some money, and then I would probably have invested in real estate, Balloon said. And so I'm like, Wow. Good job, Ruth, for being a faithful, <laughs> faithful Christian, right? Wanted to tie $37 million. You guys can do the math. That's a lot of money, right? But um, probably hearing this story, you, you guys have probably had different thoughts, right? And one, maybe you guys thought, oh, my gosh, that employee is ridiculous. He is completely fired, right? They're, they're gone. They don't have their job anymore, And maybe some of you guys thought this, that what would it feel like if a large sum, like $37 million, was accidentally deposited into your account? Probably you guys even tuned out. I was telling the story. You guys were like, man, what can I do with $37 million (laughs) if somehow Chase just decided to drop it on my bank account, right? But when I read that amount, I thought, man, how random and ridiculous was this story? It, it, It is one in a million stories And I couldn't imagine the first few emotions I would have felt if I checked my bank account and had something like this there, right? You know, I remember in college thinking that I only had $5 in my bank account. And then I looked in my app and I had $12 in my bank account and I was super excited, (laughs) right? So let alone if I saw $37 million, I would probably gone into cardiac arrest. But that's that's just me. Uh, But the title of my lesson is 37 million. 37 million. And in Romans 4... You know, the, the reason for this title is because the idea of a sum like money or, or maybe even being given to you or even a big gift being given to you, obviously it would excite us. I'm not much of a gift person. I don't really know what to tell people if they want to get me something, but let it be known. If I get a gift, I'm really, really excited. So it doesn't matter who, whatever type of person you are, everyone in this room loves gifts, Right? But yet an amount like $37 million would almost feel too good to be true, and it would definitely have the power to change our lives, right? And so the most meaningful gifts are the ones that people put a lot of thought and sacrifice to, even when it's random, when, it's don't, when you don't even expect it. Those are some of my favorite gifts. But in Romans 4, Paul talks about the true value of a gift, 
a gift given to us, especially one that we don't deserve, a gift that's too good to be true, and a gift that truly has the power to change your life. So you guys ready to uh, explore Romans 4 with me today? All right, Romans 4, we're going to start in uh, verse 1 to 5, if you guys can read your Bibles as well. um, I'll also have here, but it says here, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Well, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as gifts, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. So we're going to break this down, all right? So in this passage, we see the contention between two things, right? Works and grace. And, and as, even in our Christian walk, we've seen this battle between the two words, works and grace. And in verse 4... Paul here capitalizes on this idea of this gift, right? And this gift that he's talking about is righteousness. And in the scripture in Genesis 15, 6, what he was referring to, the scripture goes by, uh, goes something like this, and Abram believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. And so that was the scripture that Paul was referring to, and this is a different uh, translation, and it said counted as faith, and counted in Greek is legizomai. Everyone say legizomai. Legizomai, okay. So legizomai means to make an account, to make an account. And it was used in early secular documents in the ways that it defined as putting down to one's account, and so letting their revenues be placed on deposit at a storehouse and letting it be credit, right? And so there's this theologian named Kenneth West, And he said it best. That's kind of a rhyme. I didn't know how to rewrite that, that it wouldn't rhyme, but it rhymes. But Kenneth West said this, right? Thus, God put to Abraham's account, placed on deposit for him, credited to him righteousness. But catch this. He said, Abraham possessed righteousness in the same manner as a person would possess a sum of money placed in his account in a bank. Does everyone catch that? Does everyone catch what God was doing? He deposited righteousness into Abraham uh, in hopes uh, that it would change his life, right? And so in Paul in Romans 4, it shows us that Abraham was not made righteous because he worked for God's favor, but because he simply believed. Righteousness is given or was given because of the faith that he had. So how would we justify ourselves Uh, If God is making us righteous, but it's because of our faith in him and believing that he is continuing to make us righteous, that's how we know what God is trying to do and justify ourselves, right? So our self-reliance in our works is completely worthless. But all we can do is to cast ourselves on God's desire to make us righteous through his mercy and grace. Because the bottom line is God's grace is, is amazing, amen, right, and life changing, but oftentimes we run into this problem, and I'm a victim to this, that despite knowing this grace of God, despite knowing that God's grace is amazing, I can still make my Christianity work-oriented, and when I think of work, I think of obviously having a job, right, and how does the world view work? I found this Forbes article on a CEO's perspective on what makes a good job. Does everyone know kind of what makes a good job? Kind of a good idea. But I looked up this article, and agree with me or disagree with me if you want, but if you agree with me, thumbs up. But he categorizes it into what I kind of put together is the three Ps, right? The level of performance, how well you can do in your job, the amount it pays, the income and the benefits, And does my work give me pleasure? Is it meaningful work? Thumbs up if you agree with this, if these things make a good job. Okay, right? But you see here that Paul calls us to rely on God's grace rather than our works. But oftentimes, I allow some of these things to be 
the very things that can bleed into my own spiritual walk, to my own spiritual faith. And what do I mean by that? I think when I think about performance in my Christian walk, I tend to ask myself these questions. How well am I doing the things that make me a good disciple? Is what I'm doing getting noticed by other people around me? How's my performance? About pay, income, spiritually, I ask myself, well, how does my faith benefit me? God is in control of the plans in my life, but I will only put my full trust in it if, it, if I know that those plans will provide for me. Do you see that? And in pleasure, I ask myself this sometimes in my walk, do I have enough faith? Is my faith strong enough to save me? Does my relationship with God add value to my life? And maybe some of these questions you've asked yourself um, some point in your walk with God. But when we have a work mentality, what we end up doing like so many people working a job is that we start to measure what God doesn't want us to. Jesus offers us a gift of salvation because we work, not because we worked for it, but because he loved us. And kind of a good image or an example is how weird would it be if that you gave a gift to someone, they received it, and then out of nowhere they pull out like a measuring tape out of their pocket and just start to measure this, this gift, right? Or maybe they like pull out a scale and they put it on the scale to make sure if it's heavy. I don't know if this is what I wanted, right? Start to question the gift that you gave them. You know, faith is simply believing and trusting in God's desire for your life and reaching out and accepting his wonderful gift that is his grace. You know, grace uh, is in Greek, charis, and the definition is spontaneous generosity, but catch this, without nothing in return. So charis is only charis if it's done with the heart of expecting nothing in return, so thinking about this, right, what does God want us to see with this grace that he freely gives us, right? What does he want us to see? And in Romans 4, we're going to look into a couple of things, and then we're going to end off with some practicals, okay? And so the first thing is grace is God's love. And so go to, go to Romans 4, verse 6. We're going to read it together. I'm not going to put it up on the screen. We're going to read it in God's word, right? It says here, David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from work. So, so Paul's going to talk about David here. And he said here, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. And so in this passage, Paul uses an, uh, King David as another example of what it looks like to credit righteousness, and he uses his story, right? And we all know the story of King David, right? And King David's story was a story of God's unconditional love despite the works that he did, right? But also, if you remember King David, it's also a story about how God's unconditional love is still there despite the things that we can do to hurt God. Because we know that David's reputation growing up was a man after God's own heart, right? Yet, like all of us, we know that David is human and capable of making mistakes that hurt God. And church, can I be real with you for a second? All right. You know, I have made a lot of mistakes in my life. I have made decisions in my life that I regret. You know, I have deceived friends and family with my sin, I've hid my true self many times. I said things that hurt people. I lust after relationships, exploited people. You know, I'm a person who lusts after experiences to gratify cravings because I always tend to struggle with feeling dissatisfied at times. You know, when I look at my life, I am guilty of many things. But King David... He was also guilty of terrible sins, adultery, murder, lying, deceit. Yet when he writes this psalm, he's talking about that he has seen God's love despite the things that he has done. And he celebrates being forgiven in God. And I think in our sins, it's easy to feel guilty. 
and in our society or even growing up, we are taught that our actions have consequences and we must work to repair whatever we damage in our life, right? For example, when you were a kid, you lied to your parents. You have to earn their trust back. Maybe you were speeding on the freeway and you hear a cop behind you and he writes you a ticket that you have to pay. Maybe you slacked in your job and so you're scrambling to make up the time and catch up with your work. And so even when we sin, it's obvious why our automatic reaction is to work our way back to forgiveness. Then we fall into this vicious cycle of working and not thinking it's good enough. And then because we don't think it's good enough, then we feel more guilty. And because we feel more guilty, then we're going to start working. And it's this vicious cycle that we put ourselves spiritually And David shows us that in order to be free of guilt and sin, which is the definition of righteousness, is that one, we got to recognize our sin, amen? And the second, we have to admit our guilt to God and ask for forgiveness. And in Proverbs 28, 13, it says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds what? Mercy. You know, and lastly... David even shows us, even in his life, that we have to let go of our guilt and believe that God has forgiven us. Amen. Isaiah 55, 17, let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God for he will freely pardon. How crazy is that? And so the act of feeling forgiven and letting go is hard because especially when we're dealing with sins that we've at times had a hard time letting go and maybe those sins in our lives have developed these roots that kind of just anchor us to that sin it's hard and so we've wrestled with these things forever and you know i don't know about you guys but i i know that sometimes even in my sin and after i commit it right i don't know if you've ever looked yourself in the mirror and don't recognize the person that you're looking at and many times that we fall into that same, same image. And so I wanted to talk about a gentleman, probably not popular at all in society, and Ray actually gave me this story to, to, to share with you guys, but does everyone know who this is? Jeffrey. This is Jeffrey Dahmer. We all know Jeffrey Dahmer, and if you guys don't know, I'll read kind of a quick story. But Jeffrey Dahmer was known as the Milwaukee Cannibal and Milwaukee Monster, He was a murderer, a sex offender of 17 individuals between the years of 1978 to 1991. His murders involved necrophilia, cannibalism, and preservation of skeletons. And really, when we look at this man, we've placed him in the history book as one of those people that deserve the max punishment for the crimes he's committed. And when I think of, like, sentence for life or life sentence, I think about this man right here, of what he deserves. And because I look at some of the things that he's done, and I'm like, man, is that, is that guy even human? <laughs> like, like, that's crazy. But a New York Times article back in 2007 tells a story of a Wisconsin minister by the name of Roy Ratcliffe. And Ratcliffe would visit the prisons to speak with inmates and share the gospel. And so one day in April of 1994, he was in a room with Jeffrey Dahmer, who reached out to him and desired to get baptized. After Dahmer confessed his sins, Ratcliffe was just floored to hear the crimes that he's committed. Wouldn't you? Right? But Ratcliffe made sure to tell him, hey, buddy, this baptism is going to cleanse you of your sins against God, but it's not going to cleanse your crimes against the state. And so after times in discussing the grace of God, Ratcliffe states that Dahmer was, quote-unquote, seeking redemption, often referring himself as the worst of sinners, seeking forgiveness. And so a few weeks later, he was baptized. And Ratcliffe said, welcome to the family of God, and it was followed by a smile from Dahmer. Every Wednesday for months afterward, Mr. Ratcliffe met with Mr. Dahmer to pray, The convict said that he should have been put to death for his crimes, and his minister obviously agreed. And even there was a bunch of letters that would go to Jeffrey from other ministers, and some of them were 
saying you don't deserve to be saved. Some of those letters were, amen, thank you so much for repenting. And he even, Dahmer even sent a minister $5 worth of stamps asking him to mail him 25 copies of a Bible correspondence course to distribute to other, teammate, or to other inmates. So Dahmer was even ready to share what he discovered about God to others around him. And a few days later, before he was killed in nine, November of 1994, Mr. Dahmer handed Mr. Ratcliffe a Thanksgiving Day card that the minister keeps wrapped in a plastic. And I don't know if you guys can read this, um, but it said here, it said, Dear Roy, the note begins in loopy handwriting, thank you for your friendship and for taking the time and effort to help me understand God's word. And Mr. Ratcliffe continued to be identified as the man who baptized the serial killer, both in and out of the Church of Christ community. Some embraced him for it while others shunned him. This was a crazy story. And literally when Ray told us this, I was like, there's no way until I started reading articles. And I don't know about you guys, like, and, and probably I would agree but because it was really quiet when I was reading this story, that hearing a story like this, I felt co like conflicted. Because how can God forgive a person capable of doing the most detestable things? And I can't, I couldn't understand it. You couldn't have explained it to me. But what if that's the point of God's grace? That we can't understand the depths of how God is willing to give grace to those who earnestly seek Him regardless of who they are. Because imagine if God told us to live according to what we, did, what we did. And in the New Testament, we see this as a society built by Pharisees. Shame, deep resentment for what you do, public humiliation to make sure you connect with the crimes that you've committed. So why then would God build the road to righteousness according to what we do? Because I think God didn't intend for that to happen because I think of the parable of the lost son in Luke 15, right? After the son who left his father squandered his, his inheritance. But in this passage in verse 18, it, this, the, the son, when he com comes back and realizes that he messed up, he said, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. You know, the son who has sinned greatly responds like probably every guilty person looking to right the wrongs by working for their forgiveness. But the father responds, how? Filled with compassion, he met the son where he was at, embraced him, loved him, and this love for the people that belonged to sin was made evident through Jesus' death on the cross. And God ran to us by sending his son to walk with us to endure the cross. Church, the truth is that God's love is for you regardless of who you are and what you've done. Amen. Amen. And the second is this. God, grace is God's promise. And in Romans 4, 9 to 12, let's all turn there. I'll continue reading. And follow with me. It says, so is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? Well, we have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstance was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? Well, it was not after, but it was before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, but also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. And so when I think about this word, right, and I want you guys, when you guys read this again, maybe even this week, that circumcision, if you guys just replace it in the past, was a spiritual practice required for all Jewish men in order to be considered as God's special people. 
And so if you wanted to have kind of an external sign that you belong to God, you would partake in this ritual. But I think about this as works, right? And today I think about different things we do as disciples, acts of faith that we do because we have this identity as God's special people, right? In the present, I think about prayer, that we have this ability even in this country to publicly pray and to pray to our God. And that's a spiritual practice, making disciples. Matthew 28, God talks, tells us our greatest commission is to make disciples and even contribution as we talked about today. You know, but Paul recognizes that Abraham was righteous long before this ritual was even introduced to him. That Abraham serves as an example that the things we do are only reminders of our faith, and they are good things. We need to do these things if we're called to be Christians and disciples, but we cannot at all think that it gives us special merit with God. God desires our belief and, follow, and to follow in his footstep rather than our reliance on the things that we do. Because oftentimes I can use these things as a security blanket and almost like a checklist to make sure I'm doing what a Christian should be doing rather than having this mindset that God doesn't care about me doing these things. It only matters if I'm connected to him, if I'm righteous and I walk in the ways that he wants me to walk. And then Paul then furthers more explanation of God's promise and how grace plays a role. And in Romans 4, 13 to 15, this is going to be our last scripture here in Romans. This won't be the last scripture we have in Romans. But it says here that it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. And so what, Paul, what, what is Paul saying? Well, the idea of the law, which we now know to be works, cannot help us understand the goodness of God's promises. And the law isn't bad, but it is bad in, in the eyes of even Jesus because we are unable to keep it. Because how difficult would it be if we were called to determine our salvation by how well we kept the law and how well we're justified by making sure that we were doing every and single rule that the law gives, it would be impossible. But we are unable to. And so then if the law then is what we work towards, then it's inevitable that our sin is going to deserve God's wrath, what we talked about in Romans 2, right? And so the law is the line that God draws and our transgressions are us overstepping that line. And the root of sin isn't in breaking the law, but in breaking trust with God, with deliberately denying his love and the freedom he wants us to live. And catch this, right? Before Adam sinned, he broke trust with God. Therefore, God's plan of redemption is centered on a relationship of trusting love, faith, instead of law-keeping. And this plan was Jesus even dying on the cross, and Jesus said this, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. But to fulfill. So when we center our relationship with God on law-keeping instead of trusting love, we go against his whole plan with the purpose of Jesus. And what is that purpose? That through Jesus, God is doing something in your life. That he's creating promise and desiring to heal you and making a new way for you. And the grace that he so wants to give you is his recipe of success. So it's not our ability to perform or the good deeds that we stack up. But the good news is that this promise has already been fulfilled by Jesus. And we need to trust him that he has forgiven all of our sins if we live a life that believes in that. Amen? Amen. So now seeing this gift of grace, then how do we respond? So the last scripture that we're going to look at in Romans 4 in verse 18 to 25 is going to give us some practicals. And maybe you guys can catch it, but we'll break it down together. And it says here, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. 
Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So let's break this down. What are some practicals to learn from what Paul was talking about, about Abraham and how he walked and believed in God to be righteous, right? So we saw that uh, in in Romans uh, chapter 4, verse 18, or in verse 19, we we have to strengthen our faith. We need to strengthen our faith. Because like Abraham, we need to believe in God through the challenging times. And what should help us is our belief of how much His grace means for our lives. And that our faith helps us to be a church that can use this grace freely. And so if you feel weak in your faith, we really need to help each other and help ourselves really work to strengthen our faith, strengthen our trust in God. And it said here, right, followed that in verse 20. It says, well, you strengthen your faith, or Abraham strengthened his faith, and he also gave glory to God. And so the second practical is we have to give glory to God. How? How do we do that? Well, it said here, Abraham said, give glory to God by being, what, fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. And so how do we give glory to God? Well, it's not how you worship. It's not what you do. But it's how much you are assured that God has all the power and you have none. Amen? Amen. We give glory to God by knowing and, and being fully persuaded that God has the power and therefore we give him glory. Amen? Amen? And the last thing is that we build hope in others. And in verse 23 to 24, right? It said that it was credit to him were written, but it was not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him. And so what it's saying here and Paul is saying is that the righteousness is not for a select few. It's not for this specific people. But what he's saying is that it's for all who choose to believe. This righteousness that has been given to us should move us to desire the same for those around you. And we are called to have the same heart as God, which is to see as many of those who choose to believe to understand the righteousness that God has deposited in them. Because we all believe that God has given us blessing, right? We all know that God has made us righteous, amen? But God's heart is for all people. And so that means we need to build hope in others. That's the person to your left, the person to your right, and even the people outside these four walls. That God desires righteousness in their lives. So how are you going to build this hope this week for others? Maybe you're thinking, who in your life needs hope right now? And when I think about some of these practicals, and I even texted Scott, I was kind of having a hard time writing this lesson, but when I wrote down these practicals, all I could think about was Kamiko. And that literally, she lived a life that was excellent Amen. in all these things. Any conversation I would have, he, she strengthened my faith. She would watch on her bedside service midweek and would give glory to God in her bedside. And, and her championing life and leaving this world faithful, I don't know about you guys, but that builds hope in me. And our goal is to really reflect on all the ways that God has moved in our lives and the righteousness that he's deposited in you. And we really need to make sure that we give God a return with the life that we live. Amen. And so for communion, uh, I have two scriptures up there. In Leviticus 26, 13, 
It said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with, held, with heads held high. And in Galatians 5.1, kind of alludes to that passage, and it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free, amen? Stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And the yoke of slavery is our bondage to sin and God's law. And Jesus dying on the cross frees us of this bondage. And through his death laid a path of salvation for all people. Because church, we are imperfect people trying to serve a perfect God. Amen. And because God is perfect, there is no amount of work that can make us perfect enough to even be allowed near God. Think of the ways that you sinned in the past. Think of the ways that you sinned yesterday, this morning, right? When we are moved by his grace to believe in Jesus, we allow that same grace to justify us and experience this righteousness that God has gifted us. So church, let's be a people that do not squander this gift. Let's believe that we have this gift and accept it because we don't deserve grace, but we have grace. So let this grace help us become who we are intended to be in God's eyes. Amen. Amen. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Let's, let's pray to God. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, thank you so much for this time uh, to be with my brothers and sisters as we uh, open up just a, a portion of your word, God, in Romans 4. Um, it's so crazy to know, God, that we are people who are busybodies. We stress about the things of life. We work, we toil, uh, and that's probably because of a reflection of our sin in the past, God. But we work here uh, in this world, and we oftentimes want a return for the things that we do, and we live for things. But God, even in our Christianity and our spiritual connection with you, you call us to just trash all that because you've developed this grace that you so freely have given to the people that you moved through the Old Testament, even through the New Testament, and you allowed them to live lives that have been transformed by your grace. Help us to be people that do not rely on the things that we can do, but help us to reflect and be honored by the gift of grace that you've given us. Help us to not squander it, but help us to be a church that uses it to transform our lives, transform the lives that we touch, and in all together, God, that we can be more like your son, Jesus. Thank you for the grace that we received because of his death on the cross. Help us to reflect on this time as we see this sacrifice to be life-changing for us today. God, I love you. We love you. Pray for everything in mighty son's name. Amen.